will be at the soapbox and that will be followed at one o'clock Eastern time by Governor Bobby Jindo. Well, today, Senator Ted Cruz was on hand. He spoke for about 20 minutes. Here's our coverage from the Iowa State Fair this morning. Thank you very much. God bless the great state of Iowa. How many of y'all watched the debate in Cleveland? What an amazing array of talent was on that stage. How fantastic is it that we have so many young, passionate, dynamic leaders stepping up to lead this party and to lead the United States of America. And what a contrast with the Democrats. <laughs> Yet, you know, I'm pretty sure the first Democratic debate is going to consist of Hillary Clinton and the Chipotle clerk. <laughs> well, well, no, no, actually, that's not fair. We can't forget about Bernie Sanders. So now the Democratic field consists of a wild-eyed socialist with ideas that are dangerous for America and the world and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> And you know, it really is striking that the Democrats keep delaying their debates. First it was September, then it was October, then it was November. I think they may just move it to 2017. <laughs> you know, it's not widely known, but the Democrats had actually planned to have an earlier debate. The problem was the debate invitation was emailed to Hillary. <laughs> We are here today because our country's in crisis. We're here today because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids. Because our constitutional rights are under assault from Washington. And because America is receding from leadership in the world. And yet I'm here to bring you a word of hope and encouragement and optimism all across Iowa, all across this country. Americans are waking up and help is on the way. So I want to ask everyone here to look forward. Look forward to January 2017. If I am elected president, let me tell you what I intend to do on the first day in office. The first thing I intend to do in office is rescind every single illegal and unconstitutional executive action taken by this president. The president says he has a phone and he has a pen. Well, you live by the pen, you die by the pen. And my pen has got an eraser. <laughs> but sadly, the corruption has not been limited to the White House. It is extended through every branch of the federal government. This Department of Justice is the most partisan and lawless Department of Justice we have ever seen. The second thing I intend to do on the first day in office is instruct the Department of Justice to open an investigation into Planned Parenthood and these horrible videos. And to prosecute any and all criminal violations by that organization. The administration of justice should be blind to party or ideology. The only fidelity of the Department of Justice should be to the laws and the Constitution of the United States of America. The third thing I intend to do on the first day in office is instruct the Department of Justice and the IRS and every other federal agency that the persecution of religious liberty ends today. That means for our servicemen and women, 
that every one of them can pray and worship God Almighty with all of their hearts, minds, and souls. The commanding officer has nothing to say about it. And that means in January 2017, the federal government stops litigating against and persecuting the little sisters of the poor for standing for their faith. Tonight, we've got several thousand Iowans coming to the Iowa Events Center for a rally for religious liberty, featuring heroes from across the country, people like Iowa's own Dick and Betty Odegaard, who have stood for their faith and been persecuted. And we are going to celebrate heroes who have had the courage of their convictions and let them tell their stories. We've also got a concert by the Newsboys, so I would encourage everyone, come to the event tonight, 6.30 at the Iowa Event Center. The fourth thing that I intend to do on the first day in office is rip to shreds this catastrophic Iranian nuclear deal. The single greatest national security threat facing America today is the threat of a nuclear Iran. You know, several weeks ago I observed that if this deal goes through, the Obama administration would become, quite literally, the world's leading financier of radical Islamic terrorism. Now, in response to that, President Obama got very upset. He interrupted his busy world travels in between the eighth and ninth hole <laughs> to attack me, to come after me. He said, that's ridiculous. That rhetoric is too much. Do not say that. But you know, it's interesting. In the entire course of his attack, the president didn't actually bother to refute any of the substance of what I said. Let me give you a very simple point. Truth is not rhetoric. So let's review the facts. Fact number one, Iran is today the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Fact number two, if this deal goes through, over $100 billion will flow directly to Iran. Fact number three, if that happens, billions of those dollars will go directly to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to the Houthis, to radical Islamic terrorists throughout the world. And those jihadists will use those billions that we control to murder Americans, to murder Israelis, to murder Europeans. If President Obama doesn't like the rhetoric of his administration becoming the world's leading financier of radical Islamic terrorism, there is an easy solution. Stop financing radical Islamic terrorism. The fifth thing I intend to do on the first day in office is begin the process of moving the American Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel. You know, a lot of presidential candidates, both Democrat and Republican, have made that promise. And yet, inevitably, when they get to the White House, their team comes to them and they say, well, gosh, if you do that, other folks in the Middle East are going to be really unhappy with you. If you hadn't noticed, they're already pretty unhappy with us. I'll tell you the single biggest difference between me and the other fine gentlemen standing on that debate stage in Cleveland. With me, when I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do exactly what I said I would do. That's day one. <laughs> there are 365 days in a year, four years in a presidential term, and four years in a second term. By the end of eight years, there are going to be an awful lot of newspaper editors and reporters and journalists 
who've checked themselves into therapy. In the days that follow, I will go to Congress and we will repeal every word of Obamacare. In the days that follow, I will instruct the Federal Department of Education, which should be abolished. I will instruct the Department of Education that Common Core ends today. Yes, sir. In the days that follow, we will rebuild our military and we will honor the commitments we've made to our soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines. And we will allow our servicemen and women to exercise their right to keep and bear arms. That means the next time a jihadist shows up at a recruiting center in Chattanooga, he's going to discover the business end of firearms wielded by a dozen Marines. In the days that follow, we are finally, finally, finally going to secure the border and end sanctuary cities. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to stop the Obama administration's indefensible policy of releasing violent criminal illegal aliens, and we're going to pass Kate's Law. In the days that follow, we are going to take on the out-of-control regulators, the fourth branch of government, the EPA, the NLRB, the Department of Labor, OSHA, the alphabet soup that descend like locusts on farms and ranches and small businesses, and we are going to bring back booming economic growth. And in the days that follow, I will go to Congress and we will pass fundamental tax reform, adopting a simple flat tax. Yeah. Yeah. So that every American can fill out his or her taxes on a postcard. And when we do that, we should abolish the IRS. Yeah. There are about 90,000 employees at the IRS. We need to padlock that building. Take all 90,000 and put them down on our southern border. <laughs> now, to our friends in the media, I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek. But, but, but if you think about it, sir, imagine you traveled thousands of miles in the blazing sun. You're swimming across the Rio Grande, and the first thing you see is 90,000 IRS agents. <laughs> You'd turn around and go home, too. <laughs> now, some of y'all may be thinking, all of that makes sense to me. It's simple common sense. Live within your means. Don't bankrupt your kids and grandkids. Follow the Constitution. But can it happen? Can we do it? You know, Scripture tells us there's nothing new under the sun. I think where we are today is very, very much like the late 1970s. I think the parallels between this administration and the Carter administration are uncanny. Same failed domestic policy, same misery, stagnation, and malaise. Same feckless and naive foreign policy. In fact, the exact same countries, Russia and Iran, openly laughing at and mocking the President of the United States. Now, why is it that that analogy gives me so much hope and encouragement? Because <laughs> we know how that story ended. All across this country, millions of men and women rose up and became the Reagan Revolution. Yeah. 
and it didn't come from Washington. Washington despised Ronald Reagan. If you see a candidate who Washington embraces, run and hide. It came from the American people and it turned this country around. We went from stagnation to booming economic growth. We went from our hostages in Iran to winning the Cold War and tearing the Berlin Wall to the ground. Why am I so optimistic? Because the same thing is happening today. Millions of Americans are waking up. They're saying, this doesn't make any sense. You know, we just finished a bus tour through seven states in seven days. Every stop, men and women came up to me. One woman in Charleston, South Carolina, she said, you know, I voted for Barack Obama in 2008. I stayed home in 2012. And this year, I'm voting for you. Another man in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a working man with calluses on, on his hands, with, with, with grease and, and sweat on his shirt, he walked up to me and he said, Ted, I've been a registered Democrat my entire life. He said, this morning I went down to the county clerk and I registered as a Republican to vote for you. That is happening all over this country. How do we win this race? We win this right race running a populist campaign of hardworking men and women against the bipartisan corruption of Washington, D.C. <laughs> that Hillary Clinton embodies. You know, for all of us, freedom isn't some abstract concept. It's personal. It's real. It's our families. I think about my dad, Pastor Rafael Cruz. <laughs> he spent a lot of time here in Iowa. He's going to continue to spend a lot of time here in Iowa. You know, my dad grew up in Cuba. He was in prison. He was tortured as a teenager. And he fled to America with nothing. In 1957, $100 in his underwear, he couldn't speak English. Making 50 cents an hour. That would be the Obama Justice Department cutting off my microphone. <laughs> Apparently, they really, really, really don't want you to know that my dad washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. And he worked full time. He paid his way through school. He went on with my mom to start a small business. Today, my dad is a pastor. He travels the country preaching the gospel. When I was a kid, my father used to say to me over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? That is why we are here today. We are here today because the men and women at this state fair, the men and women of Iowa, the men and women of America, we are not prepared to go quietly into the night. We are not prepared to give up on our children and grandchildren. We will stand and fight for freedom. We will stand and fight for the Constitution. What we're doing now isn't working. And I got to tell you, I can't wait to stand on that debate stage with Hillary Clinton. Because together, we the people are coming together and together I am convinced, I am certain, we are going to restore that shining city on a hill that is the United States of America. Thank you and God bless you.
price for that. I want to get it to the women's restroom. He's going to be in the chain. So we're are we headed to the we're going to the right, catch up with you later. All right. Y'all, he's taking questions in the press already. So there's one question about a matter of the role you want. Senator Cruz, you have some critical words about uh, Jimmy Carter's administration. Come on. At this point, I'm visiting the grassroots activists, and what I commented on was the public policy of the Carter administration in the 1970s, and it didn't work. Millions of people hurt. And as a result, it sparked the grassroots movement to turn this country. The same thing is happening. Because we're seeing the same failed public policy, the same reaction people are yearning for mourning in America. I'm convinced 2016 is going to be an election just like 1980, and the way we're going to win, as Reagan said, is to paint in bold colors and not tail pastel. And is that appropriate given his health? Yeah, we'll slide out here. But come, come with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll sign it out there. Just, let's get... I think maternity leave and paternity leave are wonderful things. On a national I support level, them a personally, standard? But I don't think the federal government should be in the business of mandating. No, no, there's a difference. There, Mothers. There, there are all sorts of things that the federal that, that are beneficial that the federal government shouldn't do because I think the Constitution matters. And the Constitution leaves that authority to the state and local level and to the private sector, not to the federal government. And women are left behind. But, but it's interesting. We've had six and a half years of, of those big government policies, and it's women who've been left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Those policies are, are, are not working. Thank you all very much. ethnicity, zip code, and wealth. And we have never seen a Republican candidate for president who makes school choice a central issue in this national debate. It is my hope 
that at the end of my tenure as president, if I'm elected, that we will see educational opportunities and choices dramatically expanded for every child and every parent in America. Thank you for being here. Sure. Do you have a camera where? Thank you very much. Hey there, what's your name? My name is Trey. Your name's Trey. How old are you, Trey? You're four. Are you having fun at the state fair? So far, this is mommy daddy time, so he hasn't got to have fun yet. It's a grown up time. Are, are you looking forward to having a deep fried Twinkie? considerable demand for ethanol in the marketplace, and I think without yes. without a federal mandate, ethanol will continue to be demanded by the refiners. It is competitive in the marketplace, and, and we don't need it mandated by the federal government. And by the way, I would end the mandates for everything else as well. I think we should we should and for the oil companies as well. Then I think. Any subsidies directed at any particular form of energy should be intended. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Senator, you got to have one I like your cowboy boots. They're really pretty. Thank you. And what's your name? Rylan. How old are you? Too <laughs> many corn. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. Jones. And is that your brother up there? Ryan. Hey, good to see you. Ryder. Take his hand. By the way, I love your tweets. I follow you on Twitter. Thank you. I love it. I follow you too. Thank you. So you can, you can ask Bruce. I'm on my iPhone constantly on Twitter. And when you tweet, I crack up laughing. They have a lot of good ones. Thanks, Dad. We're from Illinois, um, from Jacksonville. Did you follow me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do. I know. Yeah. Uh, where? Uh, 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 hold, hold on. We'll do this picture. Guys, back up oh. a little bit. So I'm this picture right there. It's all set up. Sorry. Hey, what's your name? Kelly. Hey, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you. Thank you. I'll see you tonight. Thank you. Brian. Senator, can I get a picture? Sure. Hop in. Awesome. What's your name? Welcome to the Senate. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Absolutely, which is we need to end the Washington cartel, which is the corruption. Career politicians in both parties who get in bed with lobbyists and special interests, and we need a president who will take on the lobbyists and get government out of the business of picking winners and losers, favoring giant corporations at the expense of hardworking American citizens. So simplifying taxes, deregulation, that's the answer? Both of those, absolutely. Okay. You, you, you take something like taxes, there are more words in the IRS than there are no and, and it's a classic tool of the Washington cartel because every one of those special carve-outs and loopholes gets in there because lobbyists push for it, and those lobbyists in turn give campaign contributions to politicians. Yeah. It's one of the best reasons to have a simple flat tax, because if you have a flat tax, it means that when, when a lobbyist, when a small business owner comes to Washington, the politician can't extract any favors because you pay the same tax as everyone else does. And, and my hope is to get back to an uh, arena where Washington plays less and less of a role in our lives every day, and we empower instead hardworking Americans. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. I, thank you yeah, very much. Have fun at the fair. Oh, these are awesome. <laughs> That's safe. I will say, if I were to make a list of things I never thought would exist, this would have to be very high on that list. <laughs> Senator Cruz. Hi, it's Mike Lady. Hey, Mike. Uh, good to see you. You said you're yeah. welcome. You spent a lot of time here. Yeah. Uh, and I want to see your secret weapon among the evangelicals. Well, I don't know how much of a secret my dad is. I mean, he is. My dad has been my hero my whole life. And, you know, he spends... Keep it on Cruise. Six or seven days a week. He is traveling the country. He's speaking to pastor's conferences. He has a real part in ministry to fellow pastors, uh, encouraging them to stand up and lead. And, you know, my dad's 76 years old. He, he has a tougher schedule than almost anyone I know. And he's having more fun than he's ever had in his life because he is sharing his story. And when you've seen freedom taken away as a child, it makes it very real and personal because you know what it means to lose freedom. When evangelicals are voting for their biblical worldview, Absolutely. should they take into consideration the, the religious views of the candidate? For instance, Donald Trump is a mainline Christian, not an evangelical, and yet he got 8% of the vote in the Manapi poll. You know, Scripture commands Christians to be both salt and light. You cannot be salt unless you come in contact with that which you are to preserve. You cannot be light if you're hidden under a bush. We're also commanded as Christians to be watchmen on the wall. And, and what I am encouraging, there are about 90 million evangelical Christians nationwide, about 30 percent of the population. The last election, 54 million evangelical Christians. It is my hope that the body of Christ rises up, that Christians stand up and we simply vote biblical values. It's not the faith necessarily of the individual candidate, but rather the values that that candidate is defending. And, and, and if Christians, be they evangelical Christians, be they Reagan Democrats, blue-collar Catholics that stretch across the Midwest and up, up into New England, if we simply vote our values, we're going to turn the country to is a biblical value. How do you Thank respond you, to that, Senator? Here, we're, we're going we're to try to, we're visiting with folks. Hey, what's your name? Mike John. John, good to see you. Stephen, turn around and get your Excellent. picture with Senator Cruz. We were at the Capitol in D.C. during the Planned Parenthood. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Here, Bruce, would you take a picture? What's your name, sir? Charlie Albright. Charlie, great to see you. Northeast Iowa, and thank you so much. We've got to push the button down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Sure, the sign? Thank you very much. Thank you, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. God bless you. God bless you. What's your name? Mitchell. Mitchell? Here, you got a camera somewhere? Oh, um, Josh. I do. Okay.
Okay, are you mom? No, I'm not. Oh. So he, well, he wants right. to do it. <laughs> but I was, I'll email it to you. There you go. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah. Thank you hey, Dad, can you send my arm? Please send Yeah, like a, like a tattoo. Hey, Mr. Cruz, we just hung out with Clive and Bundy. What do you think of him? My name is Martina. We just, we just hung out with Clive and Bundy. What do you think of him? Uh, I'll confess yeah. I don't know him. Okay. No? So Clive and Bundy in Nevada, the rancher. Yeah. No, I, I know who he is, but I, I, I haven't met, met him, so I don't know him. Well, he's really cool. You should go check him out. <laughs> Center. All right. You and I, I'm going to try to visit visit with with voters instead because we we've done a media veil. All right. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hey there. What's your name? How old are you, Tegan? Five. Tegan, you're tall for five. Is that your sister behind you? No, yeah. What's your name? Yes, I do. How old are you? Eight. Eight? And are you the oldest yes. sister? Yeah. What's your name? I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.